So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for Creatio's webinar. Today we'll be discussing Creatio's ideas about the top use cases of leveraging low-code technology to accelerate customer-facing and operational processes. I'm joined by two of my colleagues today as we walk you through both a presentation and a live demonstration of this topic. My name is Craig Thibault and I look forward to hosting the discussion and we hope to make this an interactive discussion and we welcome you to post all of your questions in the Q&A section throughout the webinar. So following the discussion, we'll provide all the registered participants with a recording of this webinar and we'll answer any of the unanswered questions offline today. So we've established an agenda for today. First, we'll be telling you a bit about our speakers and giving you a company introduction of Creatio followed by a discussion of digital transformation challenges and low code. Next, we'll be discussing some use cases of low code, followed by our live demonstration of low code development led by Alex Petronenko. Then we will discuss creation of low code platform for process management and CRM, followed by that Q&A section that I mentioned previously. And again, we encourage you to post your questions in the chat section. We're very eager to answer your questions today, and we look forward to having you on our discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to Alex Petronenko just to give himself a, a brief introduction. So Alex. Hi everyone. Very excited to be here with you today. My name is Alex Petronenko. I'm the product evangelist with Creatio. I've been with the company for over eight years now, and I'm very excited to share my experience and my knowledge of local and application platforms. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. We're also joined by Eric Hale. Eric. Hey, thanks, Gray. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Eric Hale, Director of Sales Enablement at Creatio. Um, haven't been here quite as long as Alex, but um, I bring over 20 years of experience um, within uh, the CRM, low code, and business process management uh, industry. So my role at Creatio is to align our go-to-market strategy from our marketing, sales, and operations team and ensure that uh, everybody has the necessary tools uh, to meet their goals uh, on a uh, annual basis. So again, thank you everybody for joining. Great, thank you so much, Alex and Eric. Uh, and while this will be a reminder for many of you who are viewing the webinar today, just a brief background on Creatio. Uh, you know, we are a globally diverse organization with five offices worldwide, and these offices are home to over 650 employees. We have a robust and continuously growing channel network of over 700 partners. And through this channel network and this large number of employees, we actually deliver our solution in 110 countries now. We're also highly recognized by key industry analysts from Gartner and Forrester. And we'll talk a bit more about that analyst recognition later today in the discussion. Um, and this is just a, a general overview of, of what our company is all about. So uh, without ado, we'll, we'll go to the next phase of this discussion. Excellent. Thanks, Trey. And um, yeah, so we have a, a you know a few uh, insights on uh, digital transformation, uh, some of the challenges that organizations are seeing, and um, also how we can address that through low code. Uh, as um, you know, we're uh, focused on that from a creatio standpoint. Um, everything that we do revolves around uh, low code application uh, development. So when we look at digital transformation, that means a lot of different things to different people. And um, the question always ultimately is, where do we start? Um, is that you know, identifying areas for automation, um, identifying the tools that can help you get there? Uh, is it uh, you know, aligning your, um, your processes and your data? Where to begin in that digital transformation cycle? Uh, so again, digital transformation means different things to different people. Um, it's estimated that uh, businesses will spend 2.3 trillion a year on digital transformation just within the next four years. Um, of that, uh, digital experience technology is also going to hit 7.4 trillion over the next four years. And that's according to a, a recent IDC um, study that came out. So no matter where you start within your uh, digital transformation cycle, uh, it's important to keep in mind that um, you know we need to keep customers as well as employees at the center of the process. Um, employee experience is something that uh, is oftentimes overlooked within this process. Um, 
And uh, that really leads to low user adoption and also, um, you know, people not uh, getting on board with your uh, with your digital transformation strategy. So um, no matter where you begin in this, this cycle, um, and again, that will vary by uh, business to business, but it's important to keep uh, both uh, customers and employees at the center of all of your uh, decision making. And if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Cool. So when we look at uh, why most digital transformation initiatives fail, uh, it's not always associated with technology. Um, in, in my experience and in my conversations with uh, a lot of different types of organizations, it's really about communication and corporate direction. Uh, companies really need to be aligned um, you know, in their strategy, not just from the top down, but also uh, from the bottom up to ensure that their transformative, uh, their transformative efforts reach their goals. Um, so it really needs to have effective communication between the business side of the house as well as IT. Uh, so IT leaders are going to require some business acumen. And on the other side of that, business leaders are also going to need a basic understanding of technology. And with that marriage of business and uh, IT, if we can communicate and effectively align the strategy, uh, we can definitely succeed. So it's a matter of how do we align all of those resources uh, to avoid these pitfalls of uh, digital transformation, lack of employee engagement, uh, inadequate management support. Again, uh, do, we, do we have a top-down as well as a bottom-up strategy? Uh, you know, who's uh, going to be accountable for these initiatives? All of these things are pitfalls of digital transformation that um, if we don't communicate effectively, we're not going to have a good understanding of. And as we move to the next slide, uh, you know, so what does, you know, success look like? Uh, it's really when our people, processes, and tools are aligned to a common goal. And uh, if we move to the next slide, as I had mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know, we have to put the uh, employee at the center of our digital transformation efforts as well as customers. Um, so the importance of employee engagement, as I mentioned, is often overlooked. Uh, if we talk about um, you know, some of the statistics that you see on the screen here, uh, engaged employees uh, that are more present, uh, present and productive uh, are, are better uh, equipped to drive uh, results for your organization, uh, whether that's better financial performance, um, again, greater profitability, uh, happy employees mean happy customers, so you get a better customer experience, uh, and then also uh, the high cost of employee disengagement. Uh, that's an interesting um, uh, statistic that you see in the right. Disengaged employees cost U.S. companies up to 5.5 billion uh, per year. And um, you know, if we do not keep uh, our employees engaged, we're gonna lose out um, in the long run with our digital transformation efforts. So uh, by implementing uh, continuous improvement processes, um, you know, this will enable organizations, uh, they can keep their performance from stagnating or even regressing um, throughout a digital transformation cycle. Uh, so by implementing continuous improvement activities um, that can really enable organizations to look for new and better ways to work, uh, they can really double their chances of successfully sustaining improvements before, during, and after transformation. And if we can move to the next slide. Uh, so after you've aligned uh, your strategy, your processes, um, and uh, your people, choosing the right technology is really going to be um, critical to the support of your efforts. Uh, if we look at some of these statistics, um, only 20% of exec uh, executives feel well prepared for the future due to their inefficient tech stack. That's from Deloitte. Um, if we look at uh, more than 75% of digitally maturing organizations um, they provide their employees with resources and opportunities to develop their digital acumen compared to only 14% of early stage companies. So having the right technology in place um, is also uh, equally important. So once you have that strategy aligned, you, will, you define your processes and you communicate through that team, it's really a matter of defining the right technologies 
that are going to support your efforts. And if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, why low code? Uh, and as I had mentioned at the beginning of the, um, uh, the, the webinar, uh, Creatio has uh, a low code uh, application and process automation platform. And this is really what is at the foundation of Creatio. And um, why we feel that's important uh, is because it's going to enable uh, companies to be more agile. So um, having the ability to uh, create, um, you know, applications at the business level, um, they're able to, uh, you know, create those applications without any heavy IT involvement. They can rapidly create, uh, automate, adjust applications and processes based on their specific needs. And this really gives them the flexibility to meet their business objectives faster and also in a more agile way than traditional development. Uh, because low code is so easy to configure and administer, this can be a huge cost savings also to organizations. So what can you create using uh, low code platforms? Um, it, it really can be anything, right? That's, that's the answer, right? We can create everything from front office customer facing applications through back end operational processes and also automate seamless business processes between the two. Uh, so connecting that front office and back office and how does that data and, and process flow? Uh, we can do that as well. Uh, you can also easily create uh, intuitive user interfaces, data models, uh, as well as configure AI and machine learning algorithms uh, faster and easier than using traditional methods. Uh, so that's really uh, how we're able to utilize low code uh, to uh, really agilely uh, create these applications and then manage them uh, on an ongoing basis. So. If we look at um, you know, a few examples of this, I always like to start uh, from the right side of this graphic to the left. Um, so if we look at front office processes for uh, customer facing operations like sales, marketing and service, um, you know, we can start to support those, uh, but also uh, where we might overlook some, uh, some processes that can be automated is really in the middle and back office processes like say project management, approvals management, or even uh, inventory management. Uh, we can also easily configure, change, and adapt user interfaces uh, to create greater user adoption of the application. We can easily create and manage integration with other uh, third-party applications and also create workflows and processes that will lead the users to the next best action or the next best offer. Uh, so we can do that either through a process flow or a business process, but also um, as I had mentioned, because it's low code, we can also easily uh, set up uh, predictive AI and machine learning algorithms to help in that process as well. And if we move on to the next slide. So when we talk about low code platforms, uh, we really break, I, I like to break it down into four parts, um, you know, and it's really surrounding uh, designing and documenting processes. So utilizing visual modeling tools, uh, out of the box uh, templates and processes that we can configure to our uh, specific needs, um, having the ease of uh, a drag and drop interface, uh, and also uh, being able to reuse and repurpose uh, some of that technology that we're building very easily. So um, in that first part, it's really about designing and documenting our processes. Uh, and then as we move into um, some of the, uh, the other functionalities, it's really giving you the tools to administer the platform. Um, so how do we uh, scale? How do we ensure that um, we are providing the best level of security within the application itself? Uh, how do we um, uh, configure it to uh, go across multiple platforms? Also, um, when we look at processes and we look at applications, uh, we have to understand um, how they're performing and where we can make process improvements. So getting all of that reporting and monitoring into uh, that application is um, you know, gonna be equally important. And then finally, you know, once we have that up, we're understanding it, we have all the reporting and monitoring, um, it's the ongoing application lifestyle management, life cycle management of uh, that application and process as well. So uh, when we look for low code platform features, uh, these are the essential features that 
are going to uh, ensure um, the, uh, the viability of your application or your process going forward. And if we move forward, uh, so <laughs> when we say we enable citizen development, right? Um, you know, so in low code enables citizen developers. And what do we mean by citizen developer? Uh, you know, by definition, it's a non-professional who uses low code or no code technology to develop applications. Uh, you know, just uh, in general, low code um, technology is going to enable um, uh, people to become a developer in any company, right? So any business user now becomes a developer. And it's really anticipated that the market for low code platforms is going to hit 21.2 billion by the year 2022. Uh, so this is growing at a compound rate of 40%, according to analysts at Forrester. Uh, and really this creates distinct advantages over traditional uh, development solutions. Uh, traditional development solutions can be cumbersome, they can be expensive, um, difficult to customize to specific business requirements. Uh, so this is really where citizen development comes into play uh, to help organizations through their digital transformation cycles. And if we can move to the next slide, guys. Thank you. Uh, so Low-code platforms uh, really help organizations in key areas. Uh, we talked about uh, the ability for uh, business users to be able to create their own processes, their own applications, uh, their own configurations, and this really helps reduce the strain on IT departments. Uh, so when we look at citizen developers, um, they can start to take some of that configuration work um, away from IT departments. We all know that IT departments, their backlogs are growing, um, they don't have the ability to keep up with the business needs. Uh, so enabling citizen development allows IT departments to focus on the more heavy lifting. Uh, so that's one benefit of uh, low code uh, platforms and citizen developers. Um, we can also manage change more efficiently. Uh, if there's one thing that, uh, you know, the recent health crisis has shown is that we have broken processes within most of our organizations. And it's forced a lot of companies to uh, face the fact that they need to adapt to change quickly. Um, traditional development methods uh, can be uh, long in terms of their development cycles. Uh, that's where low code really can come in and enable people to adapt to change more efficiently. Uh, another uh, key component of low code and citizen development is really how we can break down data silos. Um, in most organizations, uh, customer data, employee data are all being held in disparate systems. So how do we combine all of that into a single system? Well, we can connect that utilizing low-code uh, process automation and bring all of that data into a single user interface and create custom applications that are able to leverage that data. Uh, so that really gives the ability to make better data-driven decisions. Uh, so uh, we talked about um, traditional uh, development methods as well as citizen developer me uh, methods. And um, if we look at it from a total cost of ownership perspective, uh, citizen development resources can be anywhere from 14 to 19 percent cheaper than traditional uh, developer uh, methods. So um, we can actually help to lower total cost of ownership by enabling citizen development. And last, but certainly not least, um, when we talk about uh, the employee experience, as well as, you know, increasing our, uh, our, our customer experience, um, low code can help you design intuitive user interfaces so that your employees can work the way that they live. Uh, we want to make sure that they have contextual spaces to work in uh, that makes sense and enables them to navigate systems very easily. So, uh, low code can be utilized to create these uh, intuitive user interfaces, which will help uh, increase user adoption and ensure that uh, your digital transformation cycles are, uh, are effective. Uh, so these are just some examples of how low code can help organizations move through that digital transformation cycle. Um, and um, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to move into the second phase of our, our demonstration here and show you how Creatio is uh, able to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Alex. And uh, Alex, uh, I'm sure you have some great things to show the audience.
If you're there, Alex, you might be on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yes, yes, of course, we do have quite a few amazing things that we wanted to share from our uh, functionality stack, from our technology stack, and really talk about some of the main features of a low-code application and the tools that it should have, uh, the the idea that should stand behind it when we're talking about the design of a, you know, a business application using a low-code platform. And of course, usually for me, where it all starts is really with the design of a business object uh, that is very often used for a very simple task. And you know, this is something that we call a data entry application where the attention of the user should be really focusing around the uh you know around thinking and uh you know paying attention to the user experience and how exactly this tool is going to be adopted by the end users rather than thinking about how exactly we're going to be putting together uh you know this application and this is where creation really provides a very simple you know intuitive drag and drop tool uh to configure the data attributes of the data entry application that is going to be used by those users. Uh, of course, in this case, we say that, uh, you know, in our case, we can reuse, uh, and as you know, reusability is a big thing for creation. We're trying to uh, reuse as much stuff as we can from our platform and from our marketplace, but we can reuse easily some of the columns already available in the data entry application that have been already added. We can easily add new columns easily, just, you know, drag and dropping them from the list of new columns. And we can as well uh, go and uh, take the user experience a little bit further, a little bit beyond just you know simple data entry attributes and fields, and configure uh, you know some visual components that are going to be standing behind it, some graphs, some metrics, some charts, uh, embedded directly into the uh, interface that is going to be available for the end user, right? And of course, this simple style of configuration that is really focused around you know, all of the tabs that can be added, uh, simple enabling of approvals that requires just one click from the main area of the application is really where we are focusing our attention, right? We are continuously improving these tools. We're com com continuously improving uh, the experience of our users. And we, of course, are, uh, you know, waiting and looking for any kind of feedback that is going to help us to make this tool a lot, lot better, uh, more intuitive and easier to use. Right, and of course, we say that our section wizard or our uh, application wizard is really one of the primary tools that the users are using when working with the design of the application. Because based on the design of the uh, business objects of this data entry application, we can then continue building other areas around it, right, and empower it through additional configuration. Where, for example, one of the additional tools that we are as well providing here uh, is going to be a mobile application wizard, right? Where we can as well easily incorporate any kind of existing data attributes that have been previously designed with the section wizard and really ha have uh, the data entry uh, application be uh, exposed to the mobile application, right? To provide some certain uh, type of mobility to the users and allow them to be. Uh, you know, more agile in the way that they are performing the work if this is aligned with their uh, organization's uh, expectations, right? Um, I'd like to remind everybody that our mobile application is really available for free, part of the license subscription. Um, it offers both online and offline access and, of course, is available across all of the devices, uh, mobile devices on iOS and Android, and, of course, uh, portable devices such as tablets so on and so forth. So the idea here is really not to limit our uh, customers, partners, and users on using only one specific type of technology or only in one specific way, but give them options and give them options in creating applications for both desktop uh, devices and of course mobile devices, right? And of course, usually when we talk about the automation component, when we talk about you know the uh, skeleton and you know the basis for our application we need to provide some certain level of automation to reduce the amount of the manual data input uh provided by the end users but really try to uh simplify their day in life and this is where we talk about different frameworks for automation uh, that creatio is following and those are really the two primary ones as you know eric Right. The first one is the dynamic case management framework or the DCM. 
that enables uh, even the uh, power users, the you know the supervisors, the managerial level of the organization to quickly put together uh, some quick uh, workflows, as we can call them, right? In this case, uh, and really to provide a guidance, uh, a simple uh, understanding of the steps and actions for the end users uh, that are required to be completed, right? Or are actually available just as uh, simple actions to be done. Of course, in this case, we can easily uh, extend the you know the list of the stages and the milestones that are available for the end users. We can change their color coding behind them, right? We can uh, include and move around any kind of uh, elements that are actually available uh, at each of the stages, and really work a little bit more flexible in the way that this is performed normally. Right. And of course, in this case, uh, since we do as well offer some very simple transitional conditions, if this is a required step, for example, we can then move uh, from completing this step from the review stage to approval uh, by simply taking off the step as completed and then have this done for us automatically by the system. Right. So have very simple tools without any extensive business logic, without any extensive uh uh, you know, branching that is going to make the configuration of this, uh, you know, workflow too and overcomplicated for the end users. But of course, uh, on the other hand, what we as well provide is a another way of building, uh, you know, processes and bringing more structure to those processes. And this is something that we call a business process management engine. I'm pretty sure that everybody here has heard about this framework uh, and. You know, most people that have met creation before also know that it works in synergy with the dynamic case management framework as well, where within our visual diagram, within our, uh, you know, process management engine, we can easily enrich and add any kinds of steps that are going to be executed by the end users, right? The configuration of these steps uh, does require maybe a little bit of knowledge around uh, very basic, you know, uh, understanding of the BPMN and uh, overall how the system should be executing those processes. But the good thing is that we also provide extensive training on how to use this tool. And overall, this is an, a lot easier way of managing business processes for the organization, where, of course, we are providing different types of actions that could be involved and can be used in the design. What are those are going to be driving and guiding the user through the process execution, uh, through the user engaging elements, requiring them to complete a step, answer a system question, uh, work within some certain user interfaces, you know, sending emails through templates and running approvals, or whether whether those are going to be you know just system actions and those that are going to be running completely behind the scenes without any user uh, involvement. Uh, of course, those are, you know, the basic CRUD, uh, creating, reading, updating, deleting data on both, uh, you know, one-off and single record basis, and of course, in bulk, uh, based on the selection. Uh, this can be a formula for data transformation and formula calculations, changing access rights, and of course, uh, more advanced elements of the business process management engine, such as calling web services and predicting data. And this is actually, and they actually stand uh, for exactly what, how they're called. Right. With the whole web service element, we have an ability to easily incorporate uh, an integration point into our process execution to dynamically call to an API to a web service and, uh, you know, request some data from a third party application or send the data to a third party application. Thus, again, removing this unnecessary data input between multiple systems allowing the users to be a little, a little bit more uh, agile and flexible in the way that they do their work. And of course, just, you know, um, taking that annoying uh, data entry and uh, annihilating it, right? But of course, in addition to the calling web services element, we as well have the predict data element that as well is based on our uh, machine learning model configuration that allows us to dynamically rescore the data within the process execution. Right, and because we are also supporting uh, several uh, models for machine learning, such as classification, regression, uh, predictive scoring, and recommendation systems, right? Uh, our customers and partners have a lot of flexibility in the way that they can organize and as well improve the end user work within the application because the uh, machine learning models can provide insight, can provide guidance, can provide recommendations on 
what are the best steps to be completed, in which order, and how exactly this should be uh, incorporated into their business processes in their uh, day in life. And of course, the overall approach towards the designing uh, of the business processes has been significantly simplified, right? We're constantly working on the user experience and working on the uh, design experience of the application. We uh, support uh, versioning of the business processes to easily roll back between multiple versions. We provide an extensive process log to monitor the execution of the business processes and see where exactly do we have a bottleneck in their execution, uh, what is exactly preventing us to run those processes more smoothly. And of course, the processes can be both uh, you know, user engaging, uh, they can be a combination of user engaging uh, and system actions. And of course, they can be a fully automated uh, system based only without any additional involvement from the user and really just run behind the scenes uh, supported by Rabbit MQ, uh, Rabbit, uh, you know, Q management uh, application that is going to be helping us to ensure the fail safe execution of those processes. And there's many more uh, features and a lot more functionality that we can talk about the BPM engine here. Uh, as you know, this is the core capability of our platform, our bread and butter. We as well have invested a lot in the design mode of the processes, uh, providing an absolutely free to use tool called Studio Free, where you can create your own repository of online, uh, online repository of business processes that your organization is currently uh, rediscovering. Uh, you can invite your peers and colleagues to work on those processes, export them, uh, in an image file or a BPM and formatted file. And by the way, later on, import those easily into executable diagrams of uh, Studio Enterprise or any other application that is built on top of our Studio platform. Of course, there's so much more that we can talk about. Uh, to highlight probably what is most important here is also the implementation of business rules. The fact that uh, any kind of data that is stored in the application or that can be integrated dynamically with the help of our web service uh, callouts here can be used as uh, you know a uh, configuration for a business logic. This can be easily performed and added as part of the business uh, business process execution, or we can as well incorporate and we as well design uh, business rules as part of our UI execution. Of course, in this case, uh, we can say that the users will have uh, a very simple point and click if then conditioning uh, instruments to use where they can add multiple conditions for the application to perform their actions, right? Uh, and they can then take a certain uh, action as in showing a field on the page, making it required, editable, or adding a specific uh, value filter. We can as well complete this uh, action towards uh, different types of elements such as fields, tabs, groups of fields, and so on and so forth. So the user are really not limited so it's only one specific way of using these instruments. And again, we are constantly working on development of those tools. We are constantly looking for your feedback, for your, um, for your suggestion list to make these tools even better and greater. Uh, and of course, uh, probably another quite important thing here is to as well mention that no matter the fact that we are providing all of these great tools for uh, you know, visual drag and drop system configuration for uh, you know, UI, for data model design, for you know, embedding some analytics or, or even building the specific business rules, we still allow our partners and customer access to the code as well, providing them uh, with an inbuilt IDE to continue more classic development in the application, um, not limited to only visual tools. Because our idea, our belief is that our uh, customers should be able to take full ownership of their applications as soon as they're subscribed to it. We are absolutely confident that whatever we deliver in the core of the application will remain uh, safe because of our uh, package architecture, because of how our application is built, and of course, any functionality in Croatia is extendable. It is uh, possible to override it, to isolate it from the execution. If this is something that you do not need in your application, but we just still believe that anything that we deliver to our customers is valuable and it is definitely used by them and that uh, all of them value 
and take uh, benefit from uh, we from what we design as part of the core application. And uh, probably the last but not the least, Eric, what I would like to mention here is that, of course, in addition to just the execution of the application, right, we're trying to deliver very great functionality around system analytics and monitoring. And this is where we are as well working a lot on providing very uh, visual and very clear to follow tools uh, in order to uh, display uh, analytics based on any object, based on any entity that is available in the application, right? Whether we want to perform a specific function, display the analytics in a specific uh, display mode uh, with the stacked, with legends, right? Uh, grouping them by any field. And of course, this is allowing us to quickly bring forward the performance of the users, the performance of the uh, system and performance of the uh, uh, application platform itself. So there's a lot more, of course, that we can talk about here, uh, but this is probably just you know, a quick high-level demonstration of some of those tools that we wanted to walk you through. Uh, and Eric, uh, probably at this point, I'm gonna pass it back to you, unless we've got any questions. Uh, and uh, let's see uh, what else do we have from the presentation. Excellent, thanks, Alex. I think actually um, our next speaker is uh, our good yeah, friend. You're actually handing it over to you, Alex. Um, but thanks, Alex, for that great uh, live demonstration. I appreciate that very much. And thanks, Eric, for for your discussion before. We can move forward here to you know talk specifically about Creatio's located capabilities. Uh, so if we could just go to the next next slide here. in just a moment. <laughs> the technical difficulties. Okay, oh, great. Um, so again, when we're talking specifically about Creatio's low-code uh, capabilities that is, as it pertains to uh, this discussion today, it's important to emphasize that our platform facilitates automation of all tasks, ranging in complexity, across use cases and across um, industry. So making this a really truly flexible and industry agnostic solution. Um, and you know, quickly to emphasize Creatio's vision, which we, we did mention earlier, that we believe that we've created this world where everyone can automate business ideas within minutes. Um, and you know, we have our Creatio superpowers mentioned uh, well, previously. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Uh, our unified CRM to align sales, service, and marketing, our BPM engine to change processes faster, and our low-code platform, which enable everyone to be a developer. Um, and we do provide an overview on the next slide of our product architecture. Um, as you can see here, Creatio's, Creatio's uh, low-code studio offering is built on the foundation of our full, all-encompassing CRM suite of sales, service, and marketing. And this is really what, what drives and what differentiates our platform. Uh, again, giving our users the ability to create customized applications for process management and for the unified CRM suite. Um, our low-code studio tool uh, enables users to build full-fledged applications for sales, service, and marketing functions. And additionally here, we have you know, noted that our marketplace, uh, which is the online forum where our large community of partners share over 600 add-ons, connectors, and templates used by Creatio's customers for specific needs and specific use cases um, really facilitates and, and accelerates that um, implementation process and uh, facilitates organization-wide digital transformation. Uh, and we have achieved some stellar analyst recognition over the years and uh, specifically here we mention our Forrester recognition. We're included in seven Forrester waves of which we're a strong performer in. Uh, five of these four waves really emphasizing uh, and focusing on our CRM and Salesforce automation capabilities, and two of these, um, two of the, the, the former waves really emphasizing our low code and process automation capabilities. Similarly, we are also included in uh, Gartner Research. We are included in five Gartner Magic Quadrants. Uh, the first of these two really emphasizing our low code and process automation capabilities and the uh, latter three speaking to our Salesforce automation and CRM capabilities. We want to highlight here that we are actually a leader in the Magic Quadrant for Salesforce automation and the Magic Quadrant for CRM lead management. 
Um, again, we're very proud of this analyst recognition that we've um, we've achieved, and we plan to to grow and, and foster this recognition um, as we move forward and we continue advancing our products. Uh, we also want to take this opportunity to share with you that Creatio has introduced a new online course called Low Code Application Development on Creatio Platform. And the course is aimed to help individuals master business software development without coding skills. Uh, students are provided with eight modules to learn how to develop applications on Creatio's Low Code Platform. And the duration of this uh, of course, is just eight and a half hours. So viewers can attain a, a breadth of knowledge in that time, which is you know a short period of time to accomplish all of this. So we welcome you to take a deeper look at this on our website and enroll. You know, take advantage of these great lectures and, and learn how to um, really leverage Creatio's offering. Great. So Eric and Alex, I uh, hope you're ready that we're going to move into our Q and A session. Um, Here we go. Great. Great. <laughs> so our first question is, what are the ways that low code can enable and optimize remote teams? This is definitely a really relevant question for um, today's current environment. So, you know, Eric, I feel like you'd be a good, good, good for answering this one. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you bring up a good point, Cray. I mean, I think that um, we've learned, we've had to learn, we've been forced to learn new ways to um, empower our remote teams, right? With more people working from home and working remotely than headed into the office, um, how do we keep them connected? Um, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, Zoom or, or other technologies for conferencing, um, you know, we've had to find uh, new and unique ways. So uh, really where low code can help with that is that, um, you know, we've, we've found that a lot of uh, organizations need to have um, consistent processes that will enable those remote teams to still, um, you know, remain connected. So, you know, within Alex's, you know, demonstration, we saw how we can automate uh, business processes. So that way, you know, maybe something as simple as uh, an approval process, um, you know, Typically, if you're in an office, you need an approval, you can actually walk over, tap someone on the shoulder and, and get an approval if you need it. Um, through low code, we can create, uh, you know, custom workflows and custom processes that will automate that uh, no matter where a user is working. Uh, we also saw Alex, um, you know, talk about the ability to design um, mobile applications. So how do we take our applications that are traditional desktop applications and make them uh, available for remote workers regardless of the device that they want to uh, access that on. So having that fully built into the platform, and, and Alex brought up another good point, we're not, we're not charging for this, it's within our, uh, our license uh, fee, um, being able to design uh, remote applications and, and mobile applications. Uh, so I think that that's really where low code has the agility to create those uh, processes and uh, applications very rapidly and um, really can help keep remote teams connected. Great, thanks so much, Eric. That was a really helpful response. Um, how can low-code technologies address specific vertical specialized needs? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and along the same lines, right, when we talk about creating applications, um, specific applications, business applications that are meant to achieve a, a goal, a business goal, um, we utilize our own technology, our own low-code technology, our own platform to develop specific, uh, specific vertical applications, whether that's for financial services, manufacturing, uh, pharma. Uh, we can create applications very easily utilizing low-code technologies. So um, as long as you have an understanding of what you're hoping to accomplish within your organization, um, we can create that utilizing that drag and drop if and then conditions that Alex was showing within the demonstration to create virtually any uh, business application, right? We're, we're, we're taking uh, an idea and we're turning it into an application utilizing a visual designer. So um, from a vertical perspective, you know, again, we've used it to create um, our offerings uh, in many different verticals. And I know that our customers uh, within those verticals are creating their own applications or what we like to call their creatios uh, within, their, um, within their organization. So uh, really low code gives you the ability um, to make specific vertical uh, applications 
uh, from scratch uh, without uh, relying on any heavy development resources or IT resources. Yeah, Eric, and I just wanted to add here that uh, it is actually quite interesting that we see more and more uh, you know, prospects and potential customers coming in looking for a low-code BPM uh, solution to manage non-CRM uh, you know, processes uh, and to actually build applications uh, that are coming from a different market, for example, for ERP processes. And this is a very interesting use case and again, uh, you know, kind of proves the fact that more and more organizations are relying on more, uh, you know, visual local instruments to design their applications so they have more control and more ownership over what exactly is delivered and how they can then um, you know affect those changes and make those changes in the future mm -hmm. that's a great point alex great thanks guys our next question is what are the different low code solutions available for collaboration uh, yeah, so Alex had mentioned our uh, Studio Free product. Um, this is one that I can uh, say is available from Creatio. Um, you know, so this enables teams to collaborate on uh, the design of processes or applications, um, you know, seamlessly, whether that's uh, online, offline, they're able to um, collaborate as a group uh, utilizing um, uh, a Studio Free product that uh, can help them uh, you know, bring teams together that traditionally uh, you know, might not be sitting next to each other in a room. So having the ability to use um, a low-code solution like Studio Free enables them to collaborate uh, on the design of, um, of applications and processes. Uh, so that's, that's one example. Uh, Alex, uh, I'll, I'll let you chime in. I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking. No, 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 Eric, you're doing well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we can we can move on to our next question then. So, which industry right. will be the most aggressive in adopting low code after the COVID crisis, uh, and what are the reasons why? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great question, and I, and it's it's really hard to nail down. You know, what specific industry um, is going to be the most aggressive in adopting that? Uh, but what I see. Uh, when I'm talking to uh, customers and potential customers, is that um, I, I, anybody that has a, a retail presence um, that they have customers to support uh, are really going to adapt uh, to uh, those changes uh, rapidly because there's consumer expectations are changing. Uh, consumers, uh, the way that they engage with your brand are uh, are changing as well. So uh, if we look at something uh, like a retail bank, for example, um, through this whole crisis, they've uh, they've had to uh, you know close branch locations uh, other than you know drive through uh, capability. Uh, they haven't had tellers inside, so they've had to create digital ways to engage with their customers and support their customers. Um, so they were able to maintain that level of customer experience throughout this whole crisis. Uh, if we fast forward to you know, post COVID-19, uh, that begs the question, do we need as many branch locations or brick and mortar locations as we did before? They can be expensive. Uh, they can be um, uh, you know, difficult to manage. Can we move to a more uh, digital presence and support our customers seamlessly? So um, I would say, you know, if we're, if we're looking at, you know, industry specific um, statistics, I, I think the, the, the most rapid adoption of low code will come in any form of retail. Again, whether that's banking, uh, whether that's traditional retail, uh, if that's, um, you know, uh, e uh, e-commerce platforms, everybody that has to change or rapidly adapt to consumer uh, behaviors are going to uh, be early adopters of low code tech technology because the rapid pace of those changes and those expectations um, are, are really going to either uh, drag a company down because they don't have the ability to keep up with it or it's going to propel them ahead if they can adapt uh, to those demands uh, quicker. Great, thank you so much, Eric. Um, our next question is for big companies. Um, their IT personnel generally are not adept uh, at low code solutions. What are the best arguments to change their mind? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we talked about um, 
uh, IT, uh, so the demands from business are growing faster than IT departments have the capability to keep up with that. Uh, so large organizations have big project backlogs uh, that their IT teams aren't able to keep up with uh, utilizing traditional development methods. Um, projects are, you know, prioritized by how much is it going to cost, how quickly can we implement, um, what is going to be our return on investment, where can we get the most bang for our buck. Um, so projects are prioritized, but it doesn't take away from the fact that business still has as a demand uh, for those other projects. So this backlog and IT's inability to keep up with uh, those demands from business um, are really a, a challenge for most large organizations. So um, when someone might be resistant to low code uh, technologies, uh, you know, the way that we explain it is that, hey, we can reduce some of that strain by taking um, you know, simple configurations or simple uh, applications uh, that need to happen or uh, building process flows or, or even just changing process flows or changing applications. Um, rather than put that into your project backlog and require IT to do that, why don't we put that at the business analyst level to take some of that strain off the IT department and enable them to focus on um, you know, what they're, what they're there to do. And that's really, uh, you know, keep up with the infrastructure, um, take, take that, that, that smaller portion of configuration and change management, uh, put that in the business analyst hands so that they can focus more on the heavy lifting. Uh, so I think that that's the best argument that you can give to a large organization that might be resistant to this. How do we reduce that strain, uh, reduce that project backlog, and enable your team to uh, get uh, their changes and applications out quicker and uh, producing value for them. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, another question from the audience is, we had a challenging experience last year with no code, low code. There was much more co coding required than anticipated. Can you clarify the skill set someone needs to have to efficiently learn to and utilize your low code, no code system? Alex, I think this is a good question for you. Well, of course, there's a specific, you know, very base understanding of the technology of the structure of the database uh, and how, you know, the application performs on the core level. But the good thing here is that we also provide a very extensive training around how to use our tools for configuration, administration of the application and overall low code approach. So if your organization had these issues, perhaps you were not looking to use, uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, the most friendly uh, low code application, right? So we would definitely suggest you, uh, you know, going to our website, uh, subscribing for a free 14 day trial, trying it out. And of course, looking at some of the uh, manual guides, videos, uh, you know, self-training materials that we provide as part of our academy uh, ecosystem. Great, thanks, Alex. Our next question is, what steps do you recommend a business take to properly prepare with transition from their system to yours? Uh, good, good question. Um, and, and again, that's gonna vary uh, business to business, but I, I think the most Im important step whenever you're adopting a new technology um, is to make sure that uh, your house is in order, right? All of your data is clean, and all of your data is, um, you know, ready to be transferred. So I think that, um, you know, the first step in any organization, um, you know, should be let's uh, ensure that the data that we're going to be transferring or putting into a new technology um, is clean. Because if you're trying to manage that uh, after implementing a new technology, it just uh, it gets to be difficult. Um, it can um, it can uh, prolong your implementation process. Uh, so uh, when when we look at uh, any local technology or, or platform, we look at it from the perspective of um, you know making it easier to align that data, right? So how do we break down the data silos? How do we put that? Well, if we don't have clean data to put into the new system, uh, that is going to be um, a disaster when it comes time for um, implementing the new technology. So I always, uh, you know, find that it's best to start there, make sure the house is in order. Um, and then as you're transitioning, uh, to also have a clear path on um, what you want to accomplish, right? So 
Um, a lot of times when people implement a new technology, they, they, they bite off more than they can chew at times. Um, we like to take the approach of um, uh, running in sprints, right? We have an agile approach. So again, what do we want to accomplish in the near term, mid term, and long term? And then break out that implementation cycle by that. So if they're uh, prepared properly to run in those sprints, the transition to the new technology is going to be um, a lot smoother uh, and uh, it will be a lot less overwhelming uh, to move to a new uh, new type of technology. And Alex, I didn't know if there's anything you'd like to to add to that as well, since you know you're you're more involved on the on the technical side. Um, well, I think you've covered most of it, Eric. Couldn't have said it better. Great. Great, thanks, guys. Our next question is: What could is there an example that you can provide of a, of an application for marketing built using low code? Hmm. Yeah, uh, so so marketing is is great. So we um, low code really uh, can help uh, automate a lot of things within marketing. But um, what we find low code, uh, especially within the Creatio platform, what I find um, you know key to developing um, uh, applications for marketing is our visual campaign designer, right? So as we know, there's a lot of uh, campaigns that are multi-touch, right? They could start on one channel, move to another channel, um, direct users to even, you know, maybe a third and fourth channel. So uh, where low code really helps from uh, a campaign designer standpoint is that um, you can visually uh, design that campaign. And as Alex showed within the demonstration, you know, create conditions where as that, uh, as that prospect moves through their marketing journey, uh, the next step is clearly defined. So whether that's, um, you know, you start off on a landing page, uh, there's a follow-up with an email, uh, you know, then they, they get a call or maybe they register for an event. Um, so being able to uh, fully automate um, campaigns uh, are one example. Um, but there are many that you can utilize. If you think about marketing, there's all kinds of different types of marketing. Uh, another example I might throw out there would be uh, event registration. Uh, so if you know your marketing team is putting on an event, how are your uh, people going to register? How are you going to track them? How are you going to enter them uh, into a campaign uh, um, you know, po uh, both pre and post event. Uh, so being able to create something as simple as uh, an event registration process where uh, someone can go in, register for an event, they get entered into a campaign where they'll get email reminders, um, you know, before the event, they'll get follow-up emails after the event, um, they'll be put into uh, your customer database with exactly how they've communicated uh, each, each, each touch point that we've had with them and uh, be able to track that so that way we can better understand our customers and their preferences. So um, from a marketing perspective, low code really comes into play because there's just so many ways uh, we touch our customers and being able uh, to quickly create those applications um, you know, based on specific business needs, um, utilizing that drag and drop technology um, really can uh, make uh, marketing efforts uh, really, really efficient and um, also connect all of those different points that we have, uh, those touch points that we have within uh, our, marketing, um, our marketing efforts. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Alex and Eric, for answering the questions from the audience today. I think we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so just want to um, you know, remind everyone that, um, and encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to view our digital events, um, as this is one of many events that we've produced to support our, our user community, and our external community. And just as a reminder, this webinar today is part of, part of our larger initiative to provide our external community with a large range and list of digital events and of several different formats and topics. Uh, so we invite you to check out our YouTube channel again and subscribe, and we look forward to having you on future webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you, Alex and Eric, for leading this discussion. Thank you, Craig. And uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.